Welcome back. My name is Saxon Phipps and uh, this is Year 13's Expo. And I have the privilege of introducing Scott Farquhar, the co-founder and the co-CEO of Alassian. For those of you who don't know, Alassian is one of Australia's true tech success stories. And it's an absolute privilege to have him here this evening. Scott, thanks for making the time to speak with me. It's great to be here, Saxon. Mate, so tell me, what was, um, what was high school like for you? Or what, what subjects did you do and how did it lead you into a, you know, a, a career in software? So I went to a state government co-ed uh, selective school called Jane Drews, which is out in Carlingford. And uh, look, I would say the careers advice, even though it was sort of a well-regarded school, careers advice was pretty, pretty average at my school. I, I think the career advisor was a, a part-time teacher who'd sort of given up teaching and wanted to remain associated with the school in some way. And uh, I don't really remember anything that she did apart from print out a whole bunch of university booklets and put them outside of her door as sort of the thing to do and so um you know i was i don't know for me high school in, in general was about uh more about the things after school i guess than during school so i was in the school musical i did scouts i did young achievers i uh you know kind of did a lot of things around school and so for most of my school career it was kind of the place to go uh, where you went to do the other things um and then i think yeah i ended up in year 11 and 12 sort of knuckling down a little bit. I uh, didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to go to university. And so I kind of knuckled down to try and get into university course, but didn't really know what I wanted to do at that stage. And how did you end up in software? And I think, you know, we focus a lot with Year 13 about the skills and using your skills and interests to go into a, a career in an industry that is compelling to you. How did that work for you? I was always good at maths and I was pretty good at things. Well, I don't know I was good at, but I enjoyed doing things like Lego. Although my parents, I think Lego maps have got a lot cheaper uh, because I, I remember when I was growing up, we really got one, one bit of Lego at the Lego show each year. And uh, that was all you got to work with. And, uh, and so I knew I wanted to do something engineering, science-y. Uh, I tried out for medicine. They did a, uh, back then, I think they still don't do it at Newcastle University you could effectively do a psychometric testing to see whether you could get into medicine, even if you didn't have the marks or independent of marks and being quite devastated when they said, Hey, Scott, you're not really made of the things that we need for doctors. So I, I tried out for that. Um, and I didn't, I didn't have like a strong career aspirations. I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I applied for the defense forces. And uh, back then there was a scholarship in year 11, where you would go for a single day assessment at one of the, uh, I guess the barracks or, you know, kind of one of the military bases and they would, you know, do physical and aptitude assessments. And at the end of that, they would give you a thousand dollars if uh, you effectively, you know, passed in the first, you know, top hundred people or uh, also in the country. And I did that because a thousand dollars is a lot of money. Uh, and that was a lot more than I could earn working at my checkout chick job uh, at Woolworths, which I did for, I don't know, six or seven years around then. And, uh, and so I did that. And then the idea was you got your thousand dollars and then you got automatic entry into ADFA, the Australian Defence Force Academy at Duntroon in Canberra. And I totally forgot about it. I totally uh, put that letter away. And then we moved house, my parents separated and we moved to different houses and all my mail went to a PO box somewhere. And I uh, forgot about that. Then I applied for a whole bunch of scholarships at university and I was probably back then dictated a little bit by, you know, kind of what would what would pay me money in engineering. I didn't know if I wanted to do electrical engineering or science or anything like that. I just, you know, there were a lot of different scholarships to apply for. And I was lucky to apply for a business software scholarship at the University of New South Wales. So I was pretty lucky um, that I that I got that. And then uh, after I'd done that, accepted, uh, you know, three months, basically a few weeks before I was supposed to start that, the Australian Defence Force emails, all emails, paper came through to this PO box, literally having been lost in the post uh, for three months. I looked at the date stamps and it bounced around the postal network for three months, basically saying, "Hey, are you going to turn up to ADFA in a few weeks and uh, you know get your uh, I guess scholarship to ADFA?" And so it, it's sort of a sliding doors moment for me, I guess. Like if I hadn't moved house or if I checked the mail a little bit more frequently, uh, I would probably be you know working 
in the uh, in the military, which um, I'm not sure was necessarily the right thing for me. I, I had a bit more uh, naive, I guess, to you about uh, how the world worked back then. <laughs> I picked up a couple of things there. You, know, you said that you, you were lucky a lot, but I, I'm a big believer that you kind of make your own luck and you've got to be you know, in it to win it, so to say. I picked up on things like, you know, you worked at, McD uh, at uh, Woolies, you were doing scouts, you were doing Young Adventures, um, you then took a chance with the ADF and, and what was an opportunity. You know, spotting those talents and those skills are a really important part of kind of your transition from school. What type of skills do you think young people well, sorry, let me revert, go back to that. I think one of the, the difficult things is a lot of young people don't know how to identify those skills and don't know what that really means going into the future. Someone like yourself now, in looking back in retrospect, what type of skills are important that you think young people need to be kind of engineering their futures? One thing I've been a huge proponent of and spent a lot of time on is self-improvement, as in knowing myself. And I've done that through psychometric testing i've done that through almost residential you know one day kind of self-improvement one week self-improvement retreats like you know kind of done a lot of that stuff because i think at the root of all this it's basically how fast can you learn and how you know fast can you learn about yourself and and i remember i went to university and you did these big tutorials and big lectures and so the lectures might have a thousand people in them and really, I, I don't learn that way. I don't learn. I learn from reading textbooks or I learn from interacting with stuff or playing with it. Like I don't learn from just sitting and being taught, uh, talked to. And I didn't know that. And so for four years of university, I turned up probably 15 hours a week of going to these lectures and I learned, I learned zero. Um, and I wish I'd done, you know, some testing or at least sort of thought more about it. Like what is the way that I learn best? And if I'd known that, I would never have gone to lectures. I would have gone to the library and read a textbook or... These days you've got YouTube and other things to learn uh, new skills. And so for me, I think if I could teach, you know, or give advice to, to a person of one thing they should do, it's that you should know about yourself and kind of what is it that you like? What is it you don't like? What are you good at and what are you not good at? And uh, man, I would say like, I'm still learning to let go of the things I'm not good at. Even at this stage of life, there's still things I think, oh man, if only I could be good at that and struggle really hard against it. And uh, so I think the first thing I'd teach people would be go know yourself, you know, go be comfortable with it. If you, you know, if you love engineering, go do that. If you love science, go do that. If you love art you know, or, or are passionate about, you know, uh, the arts of creativity or being outdoors, whatever it happens to be. Um, so I understand what that is and, and be comfortable with it. So that, that's number one. I couldn't agree more with you. And I often kind of use a phrase around like find your cool. So whatever you find is cool, like find out what it is and then become the coolest at what you think is cool. And it often sets you off on a, on a kind of a good path. Another kind of theory we work with is like this idea of a new collar worker. So traditionally it's been very much so you've got, you know, vocational education upon finishing school and that consists of trades and vocational education. And you've got university, which is traditionally white collar industries, but with the influence which technology's had, <clears throat> pardon me, over industries, where it's kind of like a Venn diagram. We're seeing that we've got this new collar of worker where you can take traditional trades and vocational and move it into technology. And you're seeing technology revolutionizing traditional industries. How much do you think that this is going to be a trend moving into the future? Obviously, students are looking at the next phase of their life and what labor markets are around and what jobs will be. What do you see happening with technology in, in the future and, and to different industries? Oh, I can go on for ages on this. So firstly, uh, a few things. One is over the medium term, you know, 20 plus years, the, imp uh, the impact of machine learning and artificial intelligence will have an impact on the, the job force. And, um, but it won't be necessarily distributed in the way you might expect. I think uh, human surgery, like open heart surgery, will most likely be automated before gardening is. Um, you know, even though they're both kind of effectively, you know, dexterous things, like it, it, there'll be certain things that get automated first. Um, two is that the the skills, if you are good at something these days, if you're the best in the world at something, um, you can get paid really well to do that uh, in ways that you couldn't do, you know, previously. And so. Um, and this is Eddie Wu is, a, is a, a maths teacher online. And previous, you said, if you're the best maths teacher in the world, 
you earn whatever New South Wales government math teachers earn, like just like the person who's the worst math teacher in the world working at a you know school nearby. But these days on the internet, you, you can earn a huge amount of money from what you do, um, whether that's a rock star or whether that is a math teacher or, you know, if you are the best uh, you know, at whatever you do, um, there's a lot of opportunity like to earn more. And so I think the idea that there are higher paid jobs and low paid jobs just doesn't really exist anymore. It's what are you passionate about? I love the phrase, you know, what, what's your cool and go discover that because I think that's really relevant. And a lot of the jobs of the future are coming at the nexus of two different things. And so it might be, okay, well, you are a, um, you know, you're a, you're a chef, um, but you're also great at, uh, you know, programming. Okay, you're going to go work in some career or something that puts those two things together, um, you know, and uh, maybe, you know, you're printing out, um, you make an online website that then, you know, you put in your ingredients and it spits out the recipe for your parties or it works out the, the nutrients that are going to work for you, like, you know, and suddenly you've got this dedicated, uh, you know, menu that's going to work the best for you. Who knows what the future future brings? And I think it's really working out what are your passions in different areas and bringing them together. That's where, like, I don't know, exciting things are going to happen. Yeah, and I, and I think it's one of the it's it's a really interesting process. And I listen to a lot of podcasts and self help books as well, and development books around like, you know, you do something that you're intrinsically motivated by. It means the work and the education that you do is something that compels you. It then means that you're working with like minded individuals. It builds status and respect. So. But it actually goes back to that whole idea of finding out what you're passionate about. So are you still passionate about writing software? Are you still writing software? Oh, uh, totally. <laughs> I, I, um, people ask me, what would you do if you weren't running Atlassian? And the answer is I'd, I'd go back and do something involved with software and technology. And so uh, the, the areas I don't know the much about that I think are going to be big areas, I think are around biotech and effectively how humans and technology come together in ways that they haven't done before, whether that is uh, longevity, you know, helping people live longer, whether it's curing diseases or treating diseases with, you know, specific um, interventions that don't exist uh, today. We are still at the very early stages of that. And so that's, a, that's sort of an interest of mine, which I think is going to come uh, become big over the you know coming decades. But for me, I think the um, you know, you asked me the advice for, for people. One is to know yourself, but the second one I'd say is understand skills that are going to help you no matter what you do in the future. And some of those are kind of been around for a while. I think that understanding how to communicate correctly, whether that's written form or verbal form or video, whatever it happens to be, being a great communicator is going to help you in whatever you do. Uh, things like math, maybe not, not as useful as, you know, kind of pure math, but sort of problem solving is, is another one. But those have been around for a, a long time. I think understanding how programming and how, how computers work, whether that is using, you know, Minecraft or it's Lego or, you know, um, what they've got uh, going on there. There's a whole bunch of ways of effectively learning how to program and like change the world through technology that is going to be relevant no matter what field you go into because like almost every field is going to be touched by um, technology and, and most of that is software and so understanding how that works whether it's even just programming a model in excel um, or it's you know using an online product and be able to sort of you know play with it in, in automated ways i think is going to be useful for every person i couldn't I couldn't agree more and i think what it actually allows people to do is have a, a growth mindset that it's you know it's something which is always developing and, and changing and going through its own evolution I guess if I could go back a step on that, how does you think of a, a young seven, 10 year old Scott Farquhar who's trying to make his way in the world? How would you, how do you, what advice would you give to someone that was trying to audit themselves like that to be able to understand what they are interested in and what their skills are? Because it, it can be really difficult and it can be really ambiguous to say, well, I like cooking, but what does that mean? I don't want to be a chef. So uh, uh, a couple of different things there. One is that I think of the circles of, on the Venn diagram are the things you're passionate about, things you're great at, and things the world cares about and wants to pay for. And you know it, where those three things come together is your career. Um, you can be great at and passionate about uh, things that the world doesn't want to pay for, and that's called a hobby. Uh, you know, and uh, you know that that's great too. And so. I think you've got to, um, you know, just sort of understand that Venn diagram, like that, you know, people want to pay for stuff and you're really good at it, but you're just not passionate about it. 
great, you can be stuck in a career doing that for 20 years um, and getting paid well, but you're really not living your your true life. And so I think about all three and trying to think about, you know, which of the things you're interested in or, or what you do fits into those three. Um, the second one is that I think people often say, uh, you know, they switch around their careers too often. Um, so on one hand, you want to try new things. So uh, you uh, might, for example, I did university, I did three undergraduate effectively placements at big companies. And they were great. I, I learned a lot. But I also learned from those three placements that I didn't want to work at a big company. Uh, it just wasn't sort of the right environment for me. I didn't feel like I was stimulated enough or got enough autonomy. And so I think part one is you just try different things and go out there and do it. I think a lot of people um, can spend too much time uh, studying about it or textbooks or reading it or whatever. Go out there and do a day's work experience with someone that is amazing at this um, and discover whether you like being indoors or outdoors or whether you like talking to people, you want a job that's quiet. Like there's a lot of things that you won't work out by, by looking at a textbook. Um, and then the last one is that sometimes uh, enjoyment comes from mastery of something. And, uh, and, and so too often people will, will try something and they'll try it for a week or two and go, I don't want to do this because um, I'm not good at it. And uh, if you look at what Atlassian does, you know, we make uh, software that helps people be more productive around the world and, you know, about 200,000 companies, people using our products. But if you'd said to the 18 year old Scott, hey, your life's purpose is going to help make other people more productive. I, I don't think that would have landed so well. You know, it's like, well, that's that's not a career, is it? Like, is that what I really want to do? But as you do it and you get better at it and you realize the impact you're making with people, like it's using all the skills that, I, that I'm passionate about and I love the activities that I'm doing. But I think there's an aspect of mastery um, and feedback that you get from sticking with something for a little while to understand if you're actually, you know, you're good at it. And I think it's, it's incredibly wise words and it's something that you don't actually think about a lot. That it, It's the kind of the why you do something. Um, mm -hmm. I know that Tobias Luke from um, Shopify spoke of, of when he was kind of going through a lot of his vocations. It wasn't necessarily the skills of the experience, but it was teaching him what he didn't want to do. How, how often have you seen, the, and I think you're about 10 years older than me, with some, some of your friends outside your networks that are doing things they don't enjoy doing, but kind of get caught in that rut? Because it's something that we see a lot of, that a lot of young people struggle to make those decisions and will often just take a, a, a path of mediocrity and just want to kind of flow through things. Um, is that prevalent to what you see nowadays in a lot of your friends and some of where, where their transitions post-school? There's a couple of stories here. Uh, one is my best friend from school. And you know, this is the sort of person when you're 17 and you go to a party, we would go back to his house and continue drinking until three in the morning and chatting about life. You know, that sort of great friend. And he was passionate about going and doing, uh, becoming a vet. And, you know, he wanted to do it since he was a kid. His life passion, he had a dog, or loved it and missed out on that and ended up becoming a physiotherapist instead. And these days, I cannot imagine what it would have been like if he had gone and become a vet because he's so outgoing. He loves chatting with people. He loves fitness and he's passionate about that. Uh, you know, spends his nights and weekends learning about the latest things to help, you know, fitness and, and health. And it just wouldn't have been the same, you know, as a vet who deals with people very transactionally and, you know, deals with animals all day. And so I think one thing is you don't really know necessarily what you're passionate about. And I think he was devastated, you know, kind of for probably a year after you know, was so upset that he wasn't doing vet. And in the end, is actually the best thing big for him. So there's, there's that one story. And the other one is that I remember um, there's a lot of people I think early in their career will optimize over sh short-term monetary rewards over long-term success. And long-term success usually leads to long-term monetary rewards as well. But I know many people that will choose a, a graduate job and they'll make a difference, you know, they'll choose a different job because of two or $3,000 difference between the two different, uh, you know, job offers, which, yeah, I mean, if you're in a situation where that makes, you know, life changing difference to you, that two or $3,000, then, then, then sure. But for most people they're choosing because of ego or, you know, Hey, well, I can't choose between them. I'll choose the job that has the most money. And there's a very low correlation between, you know, that company that pays a little bit more for, you know, your, your graduate salary and what you end up earning 20 years later. And uh, so I just encourage people, not to go after something that is the you know the short-term money rewards and the best advice for that is work out who you're going to work with and who you're going to learn from and that's the thing you should be interviewing for right? i mean if they're going to interview of a whole bunch of character you know what did you how do you study how good are you like what you know what are your what do you bring to the job the thing you should be asking your potential employer is 
who am I working with and what am I going to learn from them? And that has a much bigger uh, correlation with career trajectory, uh, both enjoyment and monetary rewards than whatever your you know, starting salary happened to be. That's uh, it's some incredible advice, Anne. and it's the whole time I was I was thinking to myself, I'm like, what do I work with people? Do I, do I follow these these kind of rules? And I'm like, yeah, I, I guess I do. And I, I I've, I'm one of the lucky ones that is in a career that I, I fundamentally enjoy, and I work with some some great people. Scott, what would be your, your piece of advice that you would uh, you would give to your you know your 17 year old self if you were to wind the clock back a little bit now? What would be kind of the, the one stoic piece that you'd give to them? I'd probably say don't wear tracksuit pants to university because like, uh, you know, that's, that's really not cool. And, uh, you know, and uh, I, had, I had hair back sort of halfway down my back. So not at the cool hair length you have, but the sort of <laughs> ponytail hair length that, that wasn't, you know, has never really been in fashion. So I'd probably give him some fashion tips, um, uh, you know, for back then, but. Uh, Sound like a young well, tame impala. Sorry? So you sound like a young tame in power. Actually, as a funny aside, I, I lost a bet once with, uh, we're on a total tangent now, but I lost a, we, it, it, it last thing we were fundraising for uh, in Movember. And uh, basically I said, well, you know, you sh- Movember is your, you have your most moustache and uh, you raise money. And we weren't doing so well at Alassian. So I challenged our team and we all had, a, a, I think, 100 people at the time. And I said, if we get $20,000 $20, raised, I'll get a mohawk. <laughs> Uh, no, I shaved my head. That's right. Thirty thousand dollars, I get a mohawk, and forty thousand dollars, I get a blue mohawk. And uh, and so yeah, that when I was uh, like you know kind of your age, I was walking around with a, a blue mohawk um, <laughs> as a result of, uh, of losing a bet. And um, a, a mohawk is a terribly uh, difficult um, hairstyle to maintain. Like you're not just waking up in the morning and kind of walking to work. Like, you, that takes an hour of like of, of finesse. Um, but years later a friend of mine turned up in a Bali hair salon and in the little flip through book of like the different hairstyles you can get is a picture of me no with my mobile you know, in a <laughs> Balinese like hair salon. Um, anyway, so beyond fashion advice to myself uh, from years ago, um, I think a few things. I'd say that no one cares about your TER, which became UAI, which became ATAR. Like no one cares about that number after you get into university or after you leave school, depending on you, which way you choose to do it. And I think intellectually I understood that, uh, you know, but I came from a, a school where that was a lot of pressure on that particular number. And I, I think that was unhealthy. And it really was after we sort of went to that year 12, where, you know, we got our results. I think two days later, we went to, to the pub to sort of just catch up and celebrate officially finishing school. And we asked each other all the questions then, how'd you go? You did, Bill, whatever. Never spoken again, ever again, like in my entire life. And so um, I think I'd probably stress a less about that one particular number and realize that there are so many different paths to getting what you want these days. Um, and I think particularly because um, university used to give you, you know, effectively you'd say, well, there's only one way for me to get a career and a job was to go to university. Um, and I've chatted with a lot of university um, chancellors and it used to be that um, the only way to get, you know, a degree was to go online and, uh, you know, the university say, well, we've got the best lecturers in the world. And that's totally not true. Like the best education you can get in the world is on YouTube today. Um, it's not at a university. And so if you can get the best education you can get on YouTube, then you've just got to work out how do you get certified you know, that you've done that. And that's your entry into a job uh, these days is the certification, not the education. And so, um, yeah, I think there's just a whole bunch of different ways to uh, progress in life that um, I think have changed a lot in the last 20 years. It's really funny you say that because uh, my business partner, Stubbs, who we co-founded the, the company with, he's an engineer by trade. And so I remember when he was at uni and we were working late nights in bars and he'd take like an hour at the end of the day to sit there and be like on a topic he had no idea of and he'd be YouTubing it and he'd be like, man, I didn't realize I could just do my degree like this. So it's a, it's a bit of a common, common practice nowadays. Um, Scott, I'm incredibly appreciative of your time and I really appreciate you spending time to talk at Year 13's Expo today. Uh, you're an incredibly captivating man and I think you've got a very cool outlook and I appreciate you uh, bestowing it on out the audience today. So thanks for, thanks for helping out. Thanks for attending the Expo. Thanks, Saxon. I hope everyone has a great time. Cheers, mate.